everyone has an ego. A healthy, strong ego is the basis of a successful, driven individual. But what happens when an ego goes too far? When can someone really be called an egomaniac? Sometimes I appear arrogant. Fuck you, sit down, you That's only because I'm the best. Everybody seemed very shaken up by September 11th, and I thought, I don't live in New York. What's it like to cross an egomaniac? I became totally lacking in confidence. No way was I ever going to have a mental breakdown, but by God, it happened. I'm not a person who would ever commit suicide, but the thought were very persistent. Is there a limit on how big an ego can become? What better manifestation than to be like God? He was the mouthpiece of God, and God spoke through him. So what he said was God. And what lengths would an egomaniac go to to get their own way? The bodies have been so badly beaten and so badly attacked. It was certainly a, a very gruesome scene. From the overbearing boss to the ego that spirals dangerously out of control, this film journeys deep into the mind of the egomaniac. It's all right to be arrogant as long as you're not ignorant and you're the best at your job, <laughs> okay? And I am the best at my job, so sometimes I appear arrogant, okay? That's only because I'm the best. Huge egos are often found in the world of business. Self-made millionaire Frank Tuff is responsible for creating Europe's biggest market. Camden. Now he wants to repeat the success in Liverpool. Well, yeah, usually they never listen to me, but they will do. One day, one of these days, though, they'll, they'll, they'll say, oh, golly, does know what he's talking about. Oh, no, you look after yourself. God bless, mate. Till that way. Bye-bye. 2008, yeah, is European city of culture. 1.5 million more people will come to Liverpool that year, just like they did to Glasgow. Why are they coming back? Tourism. And that's what we're about. Tourism, okay? We will create the biggest tourist attraction outside of London. Hence, people will come here. I can bring an extra 200,000 a week into, into Merseyside, which is half their population. Following Frank for a day, it's clear to see that he has a larger-than-life ego. But can he really be called an egomaniac? If I open three days a week, and you take three thousand pounds. How much is a reasonable rent? Hundred fifty. What? Hundred fifty. Hundred fifty. Yeah. Then you might as well pack yourself up and go now, because if I get you three grand a week, yeah, I'll be at least looking for four hundred pounds a bit. Okay? Are you crazy? Yeah, he came in. I swear to God, he said, "Fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you." And I was, please, take a seat, mate. T just please take a seat. Fuck you, sit down, you f and was, uh, I was sorry for using that C word, but, you know, just lost it. And then by the time he got halfway down the corridor, I got past him. So, my brother's like, don't hit him. I can go from Mika Mild to complete nutcase like that, OK? And back to Mika Mild like that, yeah? And that's the only way you can do my job. Frank Tuff has got the biggest ego you will ever, ever, ever see in a man. He thinks he is the best at everything. He is, no matter what you've done, where you've been, he's done it and he's done it better. He's the best skier, he's the best racing driver, he's the best boxer, he's the best market operator, he's the best in bed, he's the best at life, he's the, got the best girlfriend, he's got the best car, everything you can think of, he thinks he's at the top and sometimes I think, for many, Frank might appear as the ultimate egomaniac, but in today's society the term is often misused. The true definition of the word relates to something far more sinister. Professor Jeremy Coyd is a forensic psychiatrist. 
He studied the ego for over 40 years. From teenage truants to mass murdering psychopaths, he's experienced the full spectrum of what the ego is capable of. Ego is, is a, a total necessity for all people that uh, unless you have some sense of yourself and then some sense of importance and individuality of yourself, you have enormous problems. You have enormous problems in life coping and you have enormous problems in relating to others. Egomania is a, an interesting term which is not used by psychologists or psychiatrists. It actually is something that goes back to the 19th century, the idea of being essentially mad in narrow areas of life and, and behavior. Egomania, I think it is the layman's term for narcissistic personality disorder, yes. The term narcissistic derives from the mythical image of Narcissus, the boy who pined away at his own reflection and became a symbol of destructive self-love. One of the things that with narcissism is that everybody does need a degree of narcissism and in fact narcissism relates to success in life. There's a direct relationship. The more narcissistic you are, the more uh, financial material success you have in life. Psychologists have defined a list of nine characteristics associated with narcissistic personality disorder or NPD. Many of us display these traits but learn to control them. But for those who cannot, like a pressure gauge, danger arises when the needle hits red. And Frank clearly displays three of the nine characteristics. When you get confident and you can dance, yeah, the girls talk to you. And more girls talk to me than any. Arrogance. I created the biggest tourist attraction in the UK. So I know I'm good. Grandiosity. But perhaps Frank's most dominant characteristic is preoccupation with success. I drive myself hard because of failure. I never want to fail. Take the pay 105. Bollocks to Are you on South Street? I'm not a fucking stupid person, you know. I always want to succeed everything I do. I want each and every one of those people chased up right now. Yeah. Okay? The ones that you know are here. Yeah. Okay? I want their rent in, in the next 29 fucking minutes. I, I want it now. I would call myself a very confident person, not an egomaniac. I would not call myself an egomaniac. He's an idiot. John Whelan, John. John. Can I shout any fucking louder? I'm a very, very quick learner. Might take me a half a year to learn your job. Take me about half an hour to learn his. And about 15 minutes to learn hers. Okay? Sorry about that. <laughs> That's my ego coming out. Although Frank displays three traits associated with narcissistic personality disorder, to be clinically diagnosed, you need to have five or more dominating your character at the same time. Such individuals have personalities that can border on the unhealthy. Everybody seemed very shaken up by September 11th, and I thought, I don't live in New York. There are nine characteristics associated with egomania, or as it's clinically known, narcissistic personality disorder. For some, these are controllable, and like a pressure gauge, having five or more, all in the red, can define an individual as having NPD. In other words, a true egomaniac. Frank displays the larger-than-life ego that many of us are familiar with. He has three traits and is relatively low on the ladder. But adding just one more trait can make a dramatic difference. I'd hear about some disaster and people would go, oh God, I can't believe it, and they'd be obviously shaken. I'd be like, you know, I, I'd stare around and I'd be like, so what? David sits on the next rung of the ladder. 
He has four characteristics associated with NPD, and the most dominant one is a lack of empathy. For fear of losing his job, he wishes to remain anonymous. I felt it very much on September 11th, as a matter of fact. I mean, everybody seemed very shaken up by September 11th. And I thought, I don't live in New York. And I thought, boy, this isn't normal. Normal people don't feel this disconnected from the rest of humanity. I mean, they don't, they're not this selfish. Because people in my town were gathering out on the street and hugging and crying on September 11th. And I was just like, wow something's definitely wrong with me you know because I'm, I'm not getting this lack of empathy is, is one of the key features of NPD that's very subtle they don't really care they don't care if you're hurt it won't they won't be sad if you're heartbroken these individuals are often unable to love they don't have true deep feelings of caring for others but actually lack of true feelings uh, lack of feelings of guilt lack of feelings of remorse in the more severe cases of NPD can actually be facilitate you getting what you want. If you don't feel sorry because you've hurt somebody or somebody's lost because you've conned them or you've committed a fraud, then what the hell? You get on. David's lack of empathy not only affects his outlook and attitude to others, it also affects his perception of himself. As a result, some of life's most emotional moments appear to pass him by. I went to my father's funeral and people, you know, who are barely related to my dad are standing around crying. I wasn't happy that my father died, but I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't upset enough to cry. And I don't know why that is, I mean, because there's a certain amount of emotional barrenness involved in narcissism. Even what many consider to be the happiest day of their lives leaves David cold. When I got married, from the time I took my vows, I had no intention of being emotionally faithful. I had no intention of being emotionally committed. I probably had no intention of being physically faithful. It was really like I was just doing it because it was expected. You know, like, you want me to get married? Fine, I'll do it. You know, uh, I, I, will, I will show up. I'll go to your wedding, but, uh, and I'll say your words, but it means nothing to me. If I meet a bridesmaid there, I don't know what might happen. David paints a lonely existence of someone who has just four traits of NPD. To be clinically diagnosed, you need five or more. So, how can one tell? Psychologists have devised a simple test. Depending on how many times you answer yes to the following questions, may mean that you suffer from NPD. Do people often fail to appreciate your very special talents or accomplishments? Have people told you that you have too high an opinion of yourself? Do you think a lot about the power, fame or recognition that will be yours someday? When you have a problem, do you almost always insist on seeing the top person? Is it very important to you that people pay attention to you or admire you in some way? And do you feel that you deserve special treatment? Do you often expect other people to do what you ask without question because of who you are? Do you often find it necessary to step on a few toes to get what you want? Would you say that you're not really interested in other people's problems or feelings? Are you often envious of others? Do you find that there are very few people that are really worth your time and attention? Thank you very much. If you answered yes five times or more, it could mean that you have NPD. Malignant Self-Love by Dr. Sam Vaknin is one of the first true attempts to understand a narcissist. The narcissist is addicted to a drug called narcissistic supply. Narcissistic supply is a fancy term and it describes all forms of attention, both positive and negative. Narcissists are very utilitarian, very pragmatic and very flexible multi-purpose machines. They have what I call x-ray vision. They are able instantly to diagnose the weaknesses, vulnerabilities, soft spots, predilections, fears, hopes and emotional needs of everyone around them and to put it to use instantaneously, relentlessly and ruthlessly. Narcissists re never regret what they do simply because they do not hold themselves responsible to the consequences of their actions. 
Crossing these individuals can be a daunting experience, especially if you have to do it on a daily basis. The workplace is a familiar backdrop for tales of the egomaniac. For about 10 years I experienced incidents of bullying. I would often sit in my car and not be able to drive home because I was either so angry or I was just in floods of tears. The general manager had a habit of breaking down someone's reputation and then building it back up and I became his target. Charlotte was once a successful personnel manager for a high street store. Soon her dream job turned into a nightmare when her female boss began to make her life unbearable. When I first met her she was extremely charming, very friendly and personable and I felt that we would have a very strong working relationship. It was within a couple of months that things actually started to change. Her behaviour became very, very cool. She became very obtuse with me and seemed to constantly be critical of the work that I was doing. Adrian was a manager at a software company until a new boss joined the firm. My line manager called me into a room for an informal chat. In that chat it turned out that it was a, a disciplinary hearing and he said we're going to have to give you a written warning which was a, a real surprise to me and he said well your performance is being monitored people are watching you Ellen the school teacher claims the headmistress launched a smear campaign designed to ruin her the ins daily inspections became very much an intrusion in my relationship with my pupils that was what was the most difficult part of it it made me feel very nervous and it made me feel I was being watched the black shadow coming into the classroom. Most narcissists become bullies in the workplace. They taunt, they torture, they sadistically inflict pain, sometimes unnecessarily, mainly on their underlings. They are obsequious to the higher ups and sadists to their underlings. I became totally lacking in confidence. I was feeling ill. I felt Crushed. So I knew that I was under greater pressure than I could I didn't bear. feel like getting out of I bed. became extremely explosive at home because I was a complete nightmare to live No with. way was I ever going to have a mental breakdown. But I got it. Haven't I'm not a person who would ever commit suicide. But the thought were very persistent. Narcissists resent weaknesses, resent vulnerabilities. And as a result, they resent weak people, vulnerable people. That means that narcissists have an inbred aversion to children, the elderly, sick people, weak people, vulnerable people. Actually, this provokes in the narcissist a sadistic impulse to inflict further pain, to exploit the vulnerability, to enhance the weakness, to prey upon it. Narcissists are predators and wounded animals are the ideal prey. Finding someone with five traits or more of NPD isn't easy. Unsurprisingly, it's far more common to find someone who knows a narcissist rather than someone admits to being one. Dr. Sam Vaknin pointed us in the right direction. In leading a cult where critical faculties are suspended, where people are mere instruments of gratification, where discipline is maintained, where criticism is unheard of. This is the wet dream of the narcissist, to be at the center of a group of unreflecting, unthinking, totally obedient people. The cult leader is the perfect example of an extreme narcissistic personality. He typically has seven or eight traits. The most dominant ones being excessive need for admiration, and exploitation of others. Bob Pardon has studied cults for 15 years. He runs a self-help group for victims and believes religion is the perfect tool for a narcissist to control others. Uh, we're going to be dealing this time with narcissistic personality disorder and a number of years ago Judy and I came across 
the material of a man by the name of Sam Backman. And you've probably never heard of this man before, but we have found that his material has been extremely helpful to us in working with uh, folks who have come out of destructive groups. Well, from our perspective, the profile of a cult leader seems to fit almost like a hand in a glove, a narcissistic personality disorder. MPDs are drawn to cult leadership primarily because religion is tailor-made for their fantasies. What better manifestation than to be like God? Of all the cult leaders, it would be hard to find a bigger egomaniac than David Berg. His cult, The Children of God, which he founded in 1968, ended up mirroring his own worst narcissistic characteristics. It soon became a global movement, expanding to over 130 communes. But for many, it was a prison of exploitation, abuse, and mind control. Some examples of David Berg's um, narcissistic personality disorder. Uh, he certainly had grandiose feelings. I mean, he felt that he was called by God as God's end-time prophet. Uh, he was predicting the end of the world numerous times. He was certainly obsessed with fantasies of unlimited success and fame. So there are numerous, numerous examples of Berg fitting NPD across the board. For those born into Berg's cult, they had no choice but to follow his idealism, such as the Jones sisters, who witnessed Berg's extreme narcissism from an early age. It was not that Berg was replacing God, it was that he was the mouthpiece of God and God spoke through him. So obviously we couldn't, we, didn't, we couldn't understand God, we were just, you know, the stupid children. And he was the one that was going to explain God to us. So what he said was God. David Berg often said that he, he was the only one with the wisdom. He was the only one who could interpret biblical prophecy. He was the last prophet of the end. Many religious cults result in mass suicide but sometimes they are havens for something just as sinister. Berg created his own Bible in order to spread the idea of promiscuity. He was involved in all kind of sexual deviancy. He glorified just uh, sex on a level that is beyond understanding practically. Berg even used his wife Karen to entice new followers. He got this idea um, him and him and Karen Zerby would go out to nightclubs and, and stuff and he, he would get a kick and enjoy watching her flirt with these younger men or men her age and uh, you know and he thought it was a good idea that she should take them back to the to the hotel room or house and, and sleep with them you know he didn't sell it to the membership as prostitution he sold it as flirty fishing he was the fisher, the women were the bait, bait with the hook, and uh, these lonely men, lots of money, were the fish. Berg's idealism began to catch on. As the membership grew, shockingly, Berg removed the age limit for sexual partners. Sex was just a part of life, it was all around you. The adults were walking around naked, they were having sex right there every single night in your room. Your teacher would have sex right there. We'd have classes, live classes demonstrating how to have sex, teaching us. We'd have date naps where we'd pair off as even as little three, two, three-year-olds and, you know, have mock sex, basically. Except for some of the kids actually were doing it realistically because they'd been taught in a live class. You know, I had to be aware that an adult man was in love with me and I was only six years old. If there was an adult male in the commune that took a fancy to you, you couldn't do much about it, really. In some cases, even if it wasn't forced, if you, if you weren't raped, um, it was still abuse because it was an abuse of power. All the adults, there was no one that you could go to to um, complain if anything did happen. Incredibly, Berg led the children of God for a quarter of a century before his death in 1994. Some will never forget his narcissistic personality. His legacy to our generation is just a lot of pain. I've seen so many hurt individuals. I know a lot of our generation have committed suicide or gotten into yeah. drugs or, you know, they've just it's messed up their lives completely and, and, and a lot of brave ones who have moved on and made something of their lives and it's very commendable. But to our generation, only harm has come out of David Berg's teachings. With at least seven out of nine possible traits of NPD, a cult leader 
is a dangerous example of a narcissistic personality. But what type of individual would have all nine? Never before has anyone been diagnosed with the full set until now. Normally, most individuals have one or two of the characteristics of narcissistic personality. Brian had nine, all nine. In the search for the ultimate egomaniac, the cult leader displays at least seven out of nine possible narcissistic traits. Usually, with hundreds of followers, the cult leader is easy to spot. But would it be as easy to spot someone with all nine traits before it's too late? Brian Blackwell seemed like the definition of innocence, the nice boy next door. What nobody could foresee was that this 18-year-old intelligent student possessed all nine possible narcissistic characteristics, making him the most volatile, unpredictable, and dangerous of individuals. On the 6th of September, 2004, the bodies of Brian and Jackie Blackwell were found in their home just outside Liverpool. It was certainly a, a daunting scene. The bodies had been so badly beaten and so badly attacked. Was, uh, it was certainly a, a very gruesome scene. There was a strong smell of, uh, of decomposed bodies. There was a great deal of flies, uh, fly activity in the house. And it was, it was quite a remarkable scene in so much as it, uh, it was a house that had been closed up. As it turned out, probably six weeks earlier, the murders had been committed. So in actual fact, it was quite a disturbing sight. There were substantial amounts of injuries and wounds uh, to both Mr. and Mrs. Blackwell. I think they used the term frenzied attack, and, and, and that's perhaps used quite commonly these days, but certainly there were numerous injuries to both of them. Police began to investigate the murders, and it wasn't long before Brian Blackwell Jr. became a suspect and was interviewed. He denied, of course, being involved in the death of his parents and he was quite adamant of the fact that uh, first of all that we may have it wrong that they weren't his parents and secondly that, it, that he had any involvement whatsoever in it and that went on for uh, several, several sort of hours of interview. As the police continued to interview Brian they made a breakthrough in the case. They discovered a hammer amongst his possessions believed to be the murder weapon. Although the evidence against Brian was overwhelming, he would not confess. This was significant information we had to put to him. We'd also become aware during the course of his previous interviews that Brian had, becoming, uh, had grown in a great deal of confidence with the interviewing officers. In actual fact, was verging on the, on, on the point of arrogance with them, or felt himself intellectually more capable than the officers. It soon became apparent that Brian was no ordinary individual. After being psychologically examined, he was diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder. I became involved with the Brian Blackwell case because I was actually asked to explain to the media who were in a furore about the case about what was narcissistic personality disorder. It seemed to be a mystery condition. Somebody needed to explain it and so that job fell to me. Psychiatrists are reluctant to diagnose NPD so early, particularly in someone who was 18. But Brian's case was so extreme, he, he ticked all the boxes at such an early age that he was clearly a narcissist. It was only after two full days of interviewing Brian that the grisly events that led to the death of his parents would begin to unfold. From an early age, growing up in Melling, Brian's behavior didn't go unnoticed. I always thought he was a bit strange. He didn't dress like a, a oh, teenager. Like teenage, trendy teenager, nothing like that. He was like trousers and shoes and a, like an old man. a jumper, like them Pringle jumpers, like <laughs> stuff like that he did there. Yeah. yeah. And then, um, just, he wasn't allowed to play with us either when, when we were kids. Like, he was always at home doing his homework and wasn't the average teenager. <laughs> yeah, or teenager, yeah. I felt sorry for him a little bit though because his mum was always 
at him all the time, wasn't she? Yeah, like Aiming making his best his study and all the time. Like yeah. if he, you'd always hear like Brian, and like shouting and stuff like that. Didn't yeah, he's you? A, yeah, he was always studying all the time. Brian's relationship with his mother is very interesting. It would appear that Jackie Blackwell was quite a difficult person to live with. Most of her emotional needs were met via Brian. She doted on him and she very much seemed to want to keep him as a younger child. He says that his mother used to control every aspect of his life. When Brian attended Liverpool College, the controlling hand of his mother was never far away. Apparently she chose his clothes and according to him even went so far as to dress him physically in the morning. He says that she used to bath him also, which of course for a 17 year old boy is totally inappropriate. He would have perceived that as being very humiliating and intrusive. She ruled him, it was like she dressed him, she yeah. told him what to wear, she told him what to eat, what to, yeah. just how she to do him. everything. In all these situations the common thread is not recognizing the boundaries of the child, not accepting the emerging self of the child. The child is not allowed to separate from the parents. Brian Blackwell retreated very much into his fantasy world. So he would spend long periods of time in his bedroom, long periods of time at the weekend just with his parents. The patient creates a false self and replaces his true self with this concoction. He would fantasize about being a brilliant tennis player, somebody who was hugely popular and had all of the trappings of a successful sportsman. The patient then uses the false self to garner and collect narcissistic supply from people around him. Attention, adulation, admiration, affirmation, applause, and even notoriety and infamy are forms of narcissistic supply. Brian's false ego as an international jet-set tennis player took on a life of its own and soon gave Brian the confidence to meet girls. A very important development in the Brian Blackwell case was that he met Amal, a girl at college. Now there was some competition for Amal's affections and Brian felt that he really needed to impress her. He told her that he would buy her a car and he did so. In order to do this, he needed to access money and he had no money of his own, so he used any means necessary. Without his parents' knowledge, Brian emptied a trust fund to finance his make-believe celebrity lifestyle. He also employed her as his secretary. Now this was a fictitious position. She believed that he was sponsored by Nike and Fisher because he was a tennis player. Now he had no such sponsorship. He wrote a very long document detailing Amal's duties as his personal secretary and he even paid her a, a cheque for £39,000, which obviously bounced because he only had nine pence in the bank. The defining moment came when Brian invited Amal on holiday to the States to watch him play in a fictional tennis tournament. She agreed. Now, eventually, he had to stand by his word and take Amal on holiday and so I think it's significant that the death of his parents occurred the night before he was due to go away. Secretly using his father's credit card Brian bought two plane tickets to New York over the internet but after finding them his parents decided to confront him. Brian? On this particular occasion, Brian says that he simply snapped. Never criticize the Nazis. Brian. Never disagree with the Nazis. Brian. Never hint that the Nazis is powerless. What this is all about. That the Nazis is ignorant. That the Nazis is incapable of doing something. He had been hanging pictures, so a hammer was nearby. Brian picked up the hammer and he attacked his father. He said that he just launched the hammer at his father's head. Now it seems that his mother came into the room because she was aware of this melee and she came armed with a knife. Brian says that he took the knife from her, hit her with the hammer also and then he stabbed her. He stabbed her around the neck, the chest. 
He then returned to his father and he stabbed him in the throat and in the chest. He stabbed him at least 23 times and the force of the blows were quite phenomenal. In fact, his father's false teeth were knocked clean out of his mouth by one blow which also fractured both sides of his jaw. He dragged his mother by her feet very unceremoniously into the bathroom. Now I think it's interesting that his mother used to bath him. His mother used to bath him and had in fact bathed him the night before. So in actual fact, he took her to the scene of his own humiliation. Despite brutally murdering both his parents, Brian continued with his plans to take Amal on holiday to New York. One of the most incredible features of this is that having killed his parents, that within a very short period of time, he, he seems to have been able to switch off this awful event, meet up with his girlfriend, go on holiday, to the extent that he then spent almost two weeks with her, where she never suspected for a moment, apart from one incident she recalls that he, he seemed to be getting upset and went into the bathroom and came out minutes later and was fine, and he was able to put this whole uh, horrific event, uh, you know, to the back of his mind. Two weeks later, Brian returned to the house. He actually went back into the house to get something whilst his parents were there and then came out again. Now, at the time he did that, the parents must have been in an extremely advanced state of, de of, of decomposition. And yet he was able to sort of deal with that, come away and then carry on the facade. It was, it was, it, it was quite bizarre. Finally, after two days of questioning, Brian confessed to killing his parents. His case made British legal history. Narcissistic personality disorder was used for the first time successfully as a defence against murder in Brian's case. Brian was convicted of manslaughter and not the murder of his parents. The court accepted that this responsibility for his actions was diminished by the fact that he had a narcissistic personality disorder. Although Brian Blackwell's charges were reduced, it seems unlikely that he will ever be released. He certainly cannot be interviewed. Actually talking to someone who suffers from all nine traits of NPD, who wasn't a cult leader or already in prison, appeared to be an impossible task. Narcissists never admit their faults. Narcissists never accept responsibility. It's not like the narcissist is likely to come forward and proudly say, I'm a narcissist, and it's not something to be proud of. And it's not something the narcissist admits to. No, 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 forget this. It's very bad. Bloody hell. Just a second. These kids, uh, uh, shoot them. However, sometimes the answer can be staring you right in the face. Listen, if the answer is not what you expected, cut camera. I've repeated this 17 times. There are nine traits associated with narcissistic personality disorder. Grandiosity, arrogance, a preoccupation with success, a lack of empathy, a belief of being unique, a sense of entitlement, requiring excessive admiration, exploiting others, and being envious of others. Until now, it seemed as though interviewing someone with all nine traits wasn't realistic. By definition, it would make them an extremely dangerous individual. But after two days of interviewing the world's leading expert on NPD, it soon became clear why Dr. Sam Vaknin was such an authority on the subject. I've been diagnosed with a narcissistic personality disorder and therefore I'm a narcissist. And all the traits that I've enumerated before exist abundantly within me, I'm afraid. We had finally found a level 9 narcissist. Sam is unique. 
He not only has all nine traits, but he's been aware of his condition for over 20 years. I'm a self-aware narcissist, which is a rarity. Most narcissists are not self-aware. They, uh, they have no introspection. They don't have the ability to, to step aside and look at themselves and realize that they are the source of their own misfortunes, and defeats and, and troubles. But self-awareness is not like healing, is not the same as healing. If one is aware that, that uh, one is a cocaine addict, uh, that doesn't wean him off the drug. In a drastic attempt to cure himself, Sam has lived in a self-imposed exile in Eastern Europe. I was first diagnosed with the narcissistic personality disorder in 1984 or 5. My narcissism affected each and every field of my life. Cut. Let's start from the beginning. Sam's authority on the subject is second to none, but filming a level 9 narcissist was never going to be easy. I'm unable to sustain long-term relationship. I don't feel, I have no emotions that I'm aware of. Just a second, these kids are... Uh, uh, shoot them. I don't know why people are not born adults. Absolutely, absolutely unnecessary state. I'm unable to work with other people in teams. I am unable to hold on to a job. Actually, I, I'm unable to sustain any kind of social interaction. No, 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 forget this. It's very bad. Really? Cut. Beginning. And the result, of course, is that I am a social recluse. No, cut, cut, cut. I mean, we start again. Let's go on to the next question. The thing I really miss and that I would have liked to experience is the ability to feel, the ability to emote, and the ability to relate to other people as full-fledged, three-dimensional individuals. That was so-so, but I hope it captured the spirit of it. I feel sad most of the time. I feel depressed most of the time. I wish I were different. I don't think, however, that this is possible. No, cut that. I, no, let's start again. Although Sam admits his inability to have any type of emotion, he has a wife, Lydia, who chooses to stay with him, despite his condition. Regardless of what people might think of us, Lydia and I are compatible, and to some extent I think we are happy. Yeah, yeah. We, give, we, we exchange. He takes what he needs from me, I take what I need from him. My father was extreme narcissist, so I developed some senses how to cope with uh, him, to be, you know, peaceful, uh, to avoid shouting, to avoid the uh, verbal and to avoid the... Um, physical abuse by his side. Can you? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, the, the noise is not... No, I mean, but the noise is not... No, no, it's fine. Right. Why you are so aware of the environment? Why does it disturb you? Why does it disturb you? I fully you realize so that if the kids scream or music starts... Look, it's not your business. Someone else takes care about it. So enough. But I'm not in control. <laughs> yes, so be, no, you I are must too be, much I must of be in control. control. You must, must have control, control of everything, so it's I not must direct, I must direct Mark, directing me. Yeah. I need to be in absolute control. I need to be in absolute control of people, I need to be in absolute control of situations. I am a control freak. You are directing this film. I don't like that. I want to direct this film. You know, I'm the authority, I'm the supreme authority. I'm, I'm far superior to you, I'm omnipotent, I'm omniscient, you know. And you, you, you are challenging me, not by doing anything. You know, you're a very nice guy. But you're challenging me by your mere existence and by your mere position, you know. You're telling me what to do. Because I need to be in control and because I'm grandiose in my self-perception, I, I challenge authority all the time. And because I challenge authority unsuccessfully all the time, I rage. Sam is able to offer a unique insight into why an extreme narcissist can suddenly rage uncontrollably, as Brian Blackwell's defense claimed that he'd done. When I feel insulted or injured, I feel that I, I have been negated, that I've been annihilated. I feel that I'm dissolving into molecules. I feel that my very being, the core of my being, my essence, is being threatened directly. And I feel that I have to restore, immediately restore balance by nothing less or nothing short of eliminating the source of frustration. It's not really vengefulness or vindictiveness. It's a desperate attempt to kill. Even the slightest hint of criticism or disagreement 
threatens the precarious balance that I've created over many years. The balance that constitutes my personality. You are out to destroy and kill me. So I'm out to destroy and kill you. Dr. Sam Vaknin, Brian Blackwell, and cult leader David Burke are all extreme examples of narcissistic personality disorder. But can they be cured? It's very difficult to cure personality disorder. Personality disorder, by its very definition, is an enduring and stable part of somebody's psychological makeup. But what you can do is that you can help people to control their, their traits. Many therapists and, and you know, mental health professionals will tell you that narcissism is treatable, that it can be either reversed or utterly cured, or at least some of the behaviors can be modified. And that is largely untrue. Narcissism is the narcissist's personality. You can't cure the narcissist because you can't take away his personality. It's estimated that there are as many as six million people worldwide who may be suffering from varying degrees of NPD. But with such an underdiagnosed condition, that number could be far greater. So it's very difficult to know who exactly has it, because by its very definition, if you are narcissistic, you think that you are better than other people, you're great, so you're not going to go to the doctor and complain. What is certain is that those diagnosed with narcissistic personalities, in other words, true egomaniacs, satisfy their need by preying on others. And for that reason, they will never go hungry. We are superior subspecies. We transcend humanity. We are Nietzsche's supermen. We deserve the subservience and the availability of everyone around us. Luckily, every year 100 million people are born throughout the world. We have 100 million new choices every year.